Esther, thank you so much for joining us and being willing to be our first person today. It's I'm good. happy to be here. So good to have you. You have you have so much to share with us in such a short time that we'll just we'll jump right into it if that's okay. okay. Esther, you were very young, just two years old when your parents sent you to England. Although you were you were too young to be able to tell us firsthand, of course, about life in Germany and your family at the time. Perhaps you can give us a sense of Adelsheim and your family during that time before Kristallnacht and your parents' decision to send their daughters away to safety. I can. Uh, some of this I know from my sisters who didn't talk a lot and quite a lot of the rest that I know is from a man called Reinhard Lochmann who lives in Adelsheim and when I have questions I can write to him and he'll find out and send me the answers. So that's how I know. Truthfully, I don't remember anything, though I've been back to Adelsheim three times. So Adelsheim is a very small place. There were basically 10, 11 Jewish families there, and there was a synagogue. Mm -hmm. I was, as you saw from the picture, I was the youngest of five. And soon after I was born, my older sisters were not allowed to go to school in Adelsheim because they weren't allowed to go to public school. So they were living in Aachen, and that left my brother and me in Adelsheim. Uh, I don't really know a lot about the decisions my parents made as far as the kinder transport. My sisters were living in Aachen, which is a bigger city, and they were living with aunts, and they went on the kinder transport from the, there. But since neither my aunts nor my parents survived, it's hard to know exactly what went into the decisions to send us. Part of it could be because we had an aunt living in London. She had emigrated earlier. Mm -hmm. So there was someone there. But the actual what made them do right. that and how they do it, I don't know. What, your father, tell us a little bit about his business. Okay, my father had been in the First World War and he had lost a leg in the First World War. Before he went to the army, he had trained to be a baker. Well, it's kind of hard to be a baker on a wooden leg because wooden legs were not like the legs today. So he sold grain to farmers and my mother worked with him because he had to get up and down the cart. And I have trouble picturing that. I'm so used to cars and trucks thinking about how you ran a business by going up and down a cart. Mm -hmm. Like a horse-drawn cart, yeah. Had to be horse-drawn. Yep. Uh, I was born in April, and in February of that year, one of his customers sued my father because he arranged, uh, occasionally arranged a, a sale of a horse or a cow. And this person sued my father and said that he had sold him a bad I think it was a cow, and took him to court. It was very interesting. Somehow, mysteriously, I got a copy of these court proceedings and had it translated. The judge didn't even call my father by his first name. He was called Jew Rosenfeld. I mean, how insulting is that? But, of course, he lost the case because this was a time when businesses were being taken away from Jewish people. He not only lost the case, he had to pay the court case, he had to pay for the cow, and he had no business anymore. So it must have been a bit daunting for them then to have a new baby come. Mm -hmm. how, how large, Esther, was your extended family? Very. My parents both came, had, there were 10 in each family. Uh, Two, three uncles and one aunt had come to this area of the United States earlier. My mother's side, the one aunt in London was one of my mother's sisters. The rest of them, as far as we know, all were killed. Reinhardt has made a family tree and he's traced everybody. He knows when they were born, where they were sent, and when they were died, when they died. The thing that's sad to me, I haven't heard stories about any of these people, so it doesn't mean a lot to me. I look at it, and I'm glad to have it. But I wish I knew something about these people, but I really don't. You really don't, yeah. You, you, had, um, th you had three sisters and a brother. What was the age range of your siblings? 
My oldest sister, Bertel, was 12 years older. My next sister was 10 and a half, and then the next one was seven, and my brother was four years older. Four years, okay. So November 9th through 10th, 1938, Kristall knock, knock, what we call the night of broken glass. That terrible night, where so, we saw a picture in, in the opening where so many synagogues across Germany were destroyed. 30,000 men were arrested, Jewish men were arrested, stores were destroyed. That convinced uh, many German Jews, including your parents, that life under the Nazis uh, had become intolerable and, and would get worse. Do you know anything about how Kristallnacht impacted your family at that time? Well, in Adelsheim, people, they did come through the, the police, the soldiers. They came through and they ruined the synagogue and they burned the, the scrolls. My parents' home was not on the main road, so nothing actually happened to them. Okay. But the biggest impact was that after Kristallnacht, in England, the Jewish community, the Christian community, went to Parliament and asked if they could rescue, bring children to England to rescue them. And the Parliament said yes, there were a couple of things. The kids had to travel alone without adults, and there was a 50 pound fee, which was actually quite a lot of money then, because they didn't want the kids staying and taking jobs away from English people eventually. So that was the beginning of the kinder transport to England. Mm -hmm. Did your, because um, your sister Bertel was 12 years older than you, so 14 at that, or 13 at that time. Did she recall anything about, because they were in Aachen, they were in a different city. Did they remember anything about Kristallnacht? <clears throat> well, they were walking to school, and unlike now when you know the news immediately, they didn't know what was happening. And they, they passed the synagogue burning, and people told them to go home, which they did. Back to Adelsheim, yeah. yeah. No, back oh, to back, Aachen. Back to their home in Aachen. Aachen, yeah. yeah. And that. So they didn't talk a lot about it. There were a couple of things they used to say about Aachen. One, there would be people in the apartment at night who were gone in the morning. So evidently, my aunts were helping people escape from Germany. Um, Edith, my second sister, who liked to eat, talked about going across to Belgium sometimes and coming back with foods tucked in their clothing. But they didn't talk a lot about it. Bertel said she had her ears pierced because it was an old wife's tale. If you had your ears pierced, you didn't need glasses. And I don't think she actually wore glasses, <laughs> but she had her ears pierced. But they didn't talk a whole lot about it. Apparently, one of my aunts owned a nightclub, which seems kind of strange, and the other one was a seamstress. Mm -hmm. But there's so little to know about just, them. Just little snippets. Yeah, and they, they were my mother's sisters. Yeah. Your, your parents, in 1939, following Kristallnacht and everything they were experiencing and others, made this extraordinarily profound decision to send you and your three sisters and, and eventually your brother um, away. Um, I'm not your brother. Oh, away, yeah. yeah. Away, yeah. Um, tell us what you've been able to learn about the kinder transport and any arrangements that your parents were able to make. As you said, one of them was you had to travel alone, um, that there was a, a significant cost associated with it. Which I think Jewish organizations paid that. Paid I don't that, think my paid. parents did. The biggest question for me, my brother was four years older than I was. Why did they send me and not my brother? Right. We have a couple of speculations. One, that he had been sent away to school and wasn't at home when the opportunity came up. Or it was harder to send boys. But again, we'll never know because my parents didn't survive. Um, my sisters, when they traveled to England, my aunt worked as a maid, which was one of the things refugees could do. And she found three homes. My sisters were all in separate places in the London area when they first went. But as you probably know, in England, once the war started, kids were sent out of London. But they were all in different places. And we're going we're gonna to come back to that. What, um, your, your, but your three sisters went separately from you. Oh, yeah. They went into separate times. They went by a couple together. Of months. So, yeah. They went in March. Do you know why you didn't go with them? Well, I wasn't with them. They were in Arkham, which no, no, wasn't but, next door. Is that what the reason was that 
There was a kinder transplant going earlier, as far as you know? I, as far as I know. Don't know, yeah, because you, you went later. There are so many things that you can find out, and I'm constantly, we are constantly finding out things. But then there are other things that I can't seem to find out, mm -hmm. so I maybe don't know the right places to look. Well, you might, there's, as you say, you're still learning mm -hmm. many, many things. So you asked how we were placed, right? Well, before we get to that, did your, did your sisters ever talk about what it was actually like for them um, to, to get on a train and to leave by train and go to England without their parents? Did they ever share what that must have been like for them? They were very silent on this subject. Okay. My sister Edie only talked about when they crossed out of Germany, somebody gave them food, whatever country that was in. But they really didn't talk about it. I, I, I mean, you read that refugees and people who were in the Holocaust didn't talk about what happened to them, and they really didn't much. Mm -hmm. I mean, when we all got married and had kids and people would ask, the children would ask, want to ask, Bertel would say, ask me anything and I'll tell you. But if you don't know anything to ask, how do you ask? My sister Ruth, I never heard her talk about anything, though her kids seemed to think it affected her greatly, and I'm sure it did. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't a topic we talked about. I mean, they were young people trying to make their way in a new country. So a new country, your sisters arrived several months before you, then you arrived, and you all went to separate locations. Mm -hmm. Tell us where your sister, before we talk about where you went, where did your sisters end up going? Okay, my sister Bertel went to a family that had a place in Scotland, so she went up to Scotland with them. And many years later, when she was living in London with my aunt, the police came to the door and knocked on the door and said, do you know this man? And Bertel said, I don't know who that is. It turned out her foster father was actually a spy for the Germans, so he had a good cover up by having one of these Jewish kids. Once um, mm. she was 16, she came to live with my aunt and go to work. And this was the aunt that was in London? The aunt yeah. that was in London. My sister Edie lived with a family in London and then when kids were sent to the country, and it was a non-Jewish family. She went to live with a Jewish family, and Edie said they treated her like a slave. They made her do work hard. And she left school at 14. Later, when she was old enough, she joined the British Army and was in the ATS. And at some point after the war, she went back to Adelsheim and got us all birth certificates, which were good to have. Mm. And, but the one thing she talked about her trip to Adelsheim was she was walking down the street and somebody came this, up. Now she's in the British Army. Army yeah. And said, oh, uh, bist du Adel, Adels talkte? They knew exactly who she was because she looked a lot like him. Mm -hmm. Ruth in London lived with a, a doctor and his family and then she was sent to another family in the country and landed up in a hostel and she always said it was because she wouldn't do her Jewish studies, but I doubt if that was why. I don't really know why um, she was sent to the hostel. Your, what, role, what role did your Aunt Hannah play with, with four nieces in different locations, as far away as Scotland, in fact? Did she play a role in trying to keep you connected? Well, she knew where we all were. She knew where you were. And she probably communicated with our parents when they were in camps. And we, once I was there, she came once to Norwich where I lived, but there was a big tension between my foster mother and her. And then we went to London a couple of times. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Did you, do you remember or do you know if at any point you all had a visit together, all the sisters during that time? Well, my sisters came to Norwich. They did come to Norwich. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Before we come back to your time with the Harrisons, um, as you said, your, your parents and your brother Herman remained behind in Germany. Tell us what you know about what happened to your parents and then what, what happened for Herman. Okay, Herman was home for Sukkot, a Jewish holiday, and German actions often took place on Jewish holidays. And all the Jews in Baden, which is like a state, were sent to France on October, in October 1940. They went 
to Gurs, which was a work camp, and then they were transferred to Reeve Salts, which is where people with children went. And in Reeve Salts, there was a group, Ose, which rescued children from the camps and took them. They had some manor houses they'd taken over. They fed them, taught them, and that. And Herman was there. And then in 1941, they managed to bring a 1,000 children to the United States. Uh, we knew he came in 1941, but when the museum was doing research for the exhibit downstairs, what the Americans knew, the researcher found a picture of the children waiting in Lisbon to get on the ship. And there was my brother with a tag around his name, Stacy's dad and Renee's dad. Um, and they had a list of who the children were. And in the meantime, I am friends with a young woman from Vienna who's written a book about somebody else, and her person was on that list. So from what Lily has found, we know what home Herman was in because we didn't know before. And knowing this has helped find out information about Herman. And this picture, you, it's only fairly recently that you became aware of this, right? Yeah, maybe three years three ago. Three years in the last about three years? three years ago. Which, yeah. like you said earlier, you're still learning, finding things um, yeah. all these years later. Right. When, you're, when your parents sent you to England, um, and then, of course, when they went to Gurs, uh, during any of that time, do you know if you're, particularly Bertle, because she was your older sister, did anybody hear from your parents at all? Yes. In um, the 1980s, when there started to be a lot of information about the Holocaust, Bertel said, oh, I've got some letters. Well, she has five letters from our parents who were, when they were in Gers and Reef Salts. And my husband had them translated. That was they, the first time you became aware of them. Yep. Yeah, 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 we were all busy with other stuff. Right, OK. <laughs> And that, and Bertel said she'd had other letters. So the thing is, that's basically all I know about my mother. My mother wrote the letters. My father wrote three lines underneath. And that's where I know a lot. One of, in one of the letters, she talks about Herman being in one of these camps. And in another letter, she talks about that he was in this country living with an aunt mm. and uncle. So we know that she knew this and that. I mean, the thing that's interesting, she tells Bertel, we're all living in different places, and Bertel's a teenager, that Bertel should make sure we behave, we thank the people who are taking care of us, we wash behind our ears, we do our homework. You know, all the things mothers say, but there was no way Bertel could do any of that. As you said, she's a teenager, she's in Scotland, but... <laughs> Yeah. But she, but you're, you're, and even when she was in London, she couldn't. But your mother expected her as the oldest child to right. take good care of you. And the other thing she expected Bertel to do was to write to our relatives in this country and ask them to send money and to see if they could get them visas, which, get a visa, they, which they couldn't do at no. that time. August 14th, of course, is a very significant day for you. August 14th. Tell us why that's so significant. Uh, that is when my parents were deported to Auschwitz. There is a French, there's a book written by a French man. It lists all the transports. It tells you everything about the people on the transport and what day. And then when my parents got there, they were killed immediately. You even know the, the transport number. You've learned all of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, almost 77 years ago, it was August of 1942. Mm -hmm. Um, when, when did you learn about the fate of your parents? I was very protective. You haven't asked me about how I got to the Harrisons yet. Not yet. No, okay. we're going to come back to the Harrisons. I was too. very protected with the Harrisons, my foster family. And I don't remember ever hearing radio or, or even being conscious of the fact that I had parents and something terrible was happening to them. So when we came to this country, I sort of thought for a while they were going to show up. And I'm not quite sure how it dawned on me that really wasn't going to happen. I mean, Bertel knew because she had sent a letter to them and it had come back. And of course, Edith and Ruth would know then. And I guess my aunts and uncles, I don't know. Right, right. But I was a pretty unaware kid. When you actually. were a young kid, you spent eight of your first 10 years of your life living with the Harrisons. I did. Tell us, 
tell us about that time. Tell us going to the Harrisons and what you remember of your life with them. Okay. When I went to England, the Quakers found a home for me. Originally, I was supposed to go to Wales, and that fell apart. Mm -hmm. And my foster father, Uncle Harry, worked in a shoe factory that was owned by a Jewish man who put a sign up on the bulletin board, will anyone take one of these kids? So I came off the bulletin board. <laughs> they were uh, fundamental Christians. They belonged to the chapel movement, which is non-denominational. And they had one son who's still seven years older than I am. So I went to live with them. They lived outside of Norwich, which is a cathedral city, but they lived out in the country. I think most of the people who lived out there actually belonged to this chapel. Uncle Harry rode his bicycle into Norwich every day to work in the factory, rode it home for lunch, rode it back. I mean, it's such a different life. When I first got there, I had scarlet fever, and I was in isolation. But Alan used to play with me through the window. And he was their son. He was their son. Yep. I was deathly afraid of Uncle Harry. He was the mildest man you ever met. He never raised his voice. Why was I scared of him? It must have been something that happened in Alzheimer's with men. So, you know, it, in 19, I, I went in 1939. The war started in September, so Norwich was bombed. There was an American air base, so there was a lot of activity there. So we had gas masks. There was bombing. We went into raids. But it was all I knew. I was a little, little kid. What did I know different? That's how life is. Um, I went to school there. I loved school. I went to chapel with the Harrisons. And while community is a big thing in um, synagogues, churches, mosques these days. It was a big thing then. They had a lot of activities, and I always participated. And somebody asked me if I knew I was Jewish. I guess I knew, mm -hmm. but it wasn't really part of my life. The man who owned the chapel, Mr. Ramsey, tried to teach me Hebrew, but I'm really bad at languages, so I didn't really learn it. As you said, um, uh, Mr. Harrison, rode his bike uh, to and from work, and generally they lived a very simple life, didn't they? Oh yes, they didn't dance, drink, go to movies, uh, wear makeup. As an adult, they probably didn't have the money to do any of those right. things either. Parsh I mean, now that, well, they did go to Church of England before they died, but it, it was a different time. Yeah. A really and, and for time. you, though, it was a happy childhood. Oh, I was very happy. You were very happy. I loved being there. And I guess in the back of my mind, I knew I would have to leave. But I didn't question much. You know, there was that part of my life, and there's this part of my life. And of course, eventually you would leave. In 1947, your sister, Bertel, your oldest sister, arranged for you and your sisters, including Bertel, uh, to come to the United States. What? which meant, of course, leaving the place you had lived for eight of your first 10 years and the last eight years of your life at that time. What was that like for you? Well, the Harrisons didn't have a phone. You know, in 1947, everybody didn't have phones. And Bertle called the police, and they came to the door and told them they had to take me to London the next day because we were leaving. So. Uncle Harry couldn't take time off work. Alan was supposed to get some big award at school, but he didn't go. So Alan and Auntie Dot took me to London and handed me over. Alan has since told me his mother's hair turned gray overnight. Now, mm -hmm. maybe it did, maybe it didn't. But she also knew that I was going to leave because she had saved a lot of stuff that she gave me when I went to visit. And one of them was a picture of me with a beef eater earlier that year in the summer. I never looked on the back. A couple of months ago, I looked on the back. Guess what? We were in London to see if we could get on a ship to leave. Oh, is that right? You just, just found that out? I just found that out. But Bloomsbury House was the place in London that looked after the refugees, and they actually arranged for us to leave. And the other thing is I have a, um, it's not a passport. It's a travel document. I had signed it. I'd had to have pictures taken. What did I think they were for? Right. But maybe I didn't want to think about it because I really didn't want to leave. 
So we sailed on the Queen Mary, which had been a troop ship during the war, so it still wasn't fancy. And there was a strike because somebody from the royal family was traveling on it. And it's a good time to strike when there's a royal family person. But Bertel had a boyfriend who was a butcher, and she had, he'd given her a sausage to travel with. I mean, what do you give someone who's going away a sausage? <laughs> and my aunt had given us bread, so we didn't really go hungry, and they gave the kids milk, and it was very short. Mm -hmm. I was very seasick. I really didn't want to be there. And later I found out Bertel didn't really want to go either, but our mother and father had said we had to come here because we had uncles here. Mm -hmm. so that, we, that was the reason for the United States coming yeah. here. So we landed in New York, and two uncles met us. One was an uncle who'd married into the family, and one was an uncle who had lived in Ottelsheim, and Bertel knew him. I didn't know them at all. And we came to Washington, and we lived with a different aunt and uncle than my brother Herman. It was not a good experience. First of all, you know, I'd lived out in the country, very quiet. This was on a main street in Washington, D.C. My uncle sort of had a temper. He threw furniture occasionally. My aunt was... So very different than, uh, than <laughs> yes. Mr. Harrison. Yeah. My aunt was mentally ill before they had all the medicines, so she did weird things, took the sheets off our bed when we were sleeping, it kept food till it was bad, but that was okay. I mean, they loved us in their way. It was just, it was very different. My uncle took me kicking and screaming one day to see a movie. I like movies okay, but I'm not a big movie person. Before we continue on about your new life in the United States, um, it was 1947 when you came here. Do you know why it took two years after the war for you to be able to come to the United States? Because war ended in May of 45. You know, you're not supposed to ask me questions. I don't know the answer to. <laughs> I have no I mean, idea. I'm sure it had to do with, you know, just being able to make the arrangements. I think Because so. they had to, Bertel had to connect with the relatives of the United States. They had to get affidavits. And, and I think Bloomsbury has had to do some of they this. Did, they did some of that work yeah. to get you here. Um, you're, going back to your sisters, you had said, I think it was your sister Edith who had gone to the countryside where she did not have a happy experience, con contrasted to your your happy experience with the Harrisons. What about your other two sisters? What was it like for them? Well, Bertel lived with my aunt. My aunt... In London. In London, after when she was 16. My aunt could get very upset. I mean, Bertel didn't bake for years because my aunt, when she was angry, would bake. <laughs> that, um, you know, I said at the beginning they didn't talk a lot. They really didn't. Edie had a really good friend, Averill, who she kept sort of in contact with, and that I think when she joined the army, she was happier. She had good friends in the army, and that. And she came a year later because she had to get demobbed oh, okay. from the army. Um, Ruth didn't really talk about it. So, and I didn't ask. And you didn't ask. And so here you are, you're, I, you're 10 years of age when you land in the United States. You just told us about the family you stayed with in Washington. In, in general, the transition was a, was a difficult one for you. Yes. Um, English schools at that time were way ahead of American schools. And I went to a school where the, there were three or four classes, because then you, didn't, you had 6A, 6B. The teacher. I spoke perfect English, and she made fun of my English because some of my words were different. Um, I also have a lazy eye, and somebody thought when I was 10, being pretty weird already as an as a immigrant, I had to wear a patch on my eye, which I took off as soon as I left the house, and it was a big surprise for me when I learned the school knew I was supposed to be wearing it. But I also was Jewish now. I mean, everything was different, and while I knew my sisters. I hadn't really lived with them, so I didn't really know my sister. And then I had this brother who wasn't Alan, my foster brother, but I had this nice brother, Herman, but we didn't live together. So it was a very different world. And eventually you would end up living with your sisters. 
Right. right. Once, tell, tell us about that. Once they both got jobs, they got an apartment. And thank goodness they took me to live with them. And it was really interesting. Sometimes they were dating teachers in the schools I was going to because it was the right age range. But they were really good. Among other things, they were wise. They made me write to the Harrisons. So the Harrisons have always been part of my life and my family's life. Um, they also uh, encouraged me in school. They never said, oh, you can't go to college because who's going to pay for it? It never dawned on me I couldn't go to college. I mean, that's what I said. Where was my brain? Mm -hmm. So my sister Ruth, the one close seven years, she had gone to the University of Maryland because she graduated from high school soon after she came here. But back then, you could work and earn your room, board, and tuition, which is what she did. Of course, by the time I went, that wasn't true. Mm -hmm. But um, I graduated from high school just after I was 16, not because I'm particularly smart, but because I was skipped when I came. And Ruth, by that time, was married, so my brother-in-law was in a PhD program at the University of Illinois, so I went to live with them. And my brother-in-law became my guardian. Every once in a while, he tried to tell me what to do, which was not good, because I wasn't <laughs> used to people telling me that. But, you know, having in-state tuition, it worked well for them, because I could help with their little boy. And I got a good education. You know, I think back to you sharing with us the letter from your mother to Bertle about, you know, make sure you wash behind your ears and you say thank you. Bertle took that responsibility and, and really took care of you and got you to the United States. It, it, she played an immense role there, didn't she? We got a small amount of money from Germany at that time. Bertel had written an endless letter. There's now something called the Claims Conference, right. and it's a procedure, but back then there wasn't. You had to type and use carbon paper. She spent a lot of time on this, and we got a small amount of money, like $20 a month. And she made all my siblings give it to me for college. Mm -hmm. Some of them weren't real happy about that. <laughs> but, but she did it. I mean, she was a force not to be reckoned with. She was very Germanic, left, right, black, white, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. very much so. Tell us about your relationship with the Harrisons, because as you said, that, that, in, that has endured. Yeah, so once um, my foster brother, Alan, came over here as an exchange teacher once, and once oh, I got married and had two kids, one who's sitting here, um, we went to visit them in Norwich, and it was back when you still dressed up to go on an airplane. I mean, they were three and four, they had little suits on, and we went to visit in Norwich. But we decided at some point the Harrisons should come to the United States, and we brought them over. And Alan was teaching. They had probably never been on an airplane. Been on an airplane, no. Um, Alan was teaching in New Jersey, and we said, find a beach for us to go to. And he found a beach, I can't think of the name of it. It was a terrible place, it had a mosquito problem. <laughs> they had, we all went up to this place and they sprayed every night for mosquitoes, but we didn't tell Alan he was sleeping on the porch and he got sprayed. We figured he deserved it. <laughs> but the Harrisons were so trusting. I mean, they really were. And after Auntie Dot died, Uncle Harry used to come every summer and spend six weeks with us. He loved coming. I was ready for him to leave after five. Um, <laughs> but he loved going to synagogue with my husband. He loved the brotherhood. He just loved it. Mm. And after he died, Alan found out that Uncle Harry's father was Jewish. He, was, had, he had been a pretty good photographer, and he had come from Poland, married Alan's grandmother. They had two kids, and then he left. And she landed up in the poorhouse with these two kids. But that probably explains why he liked all the Jewish stuff so much. And, and Alan is still alive, and he, you still... Yeah, I was just visited him in April. He doesn't really travel anymore, so I go there. He used to come here a lot. And it was interesting. I mean, I think my kids kind of thought of the Harrisons as grandparents. They knew they weren't. Alan was always Alan. He was never Uncle Alan. It was just kind of interesting how that happened. You, um, you also learned, I think, relatively recently that there were other kinder transport children in the area where you were living with the Harrisons. 
Did you have any idea of that I had at the no time? no idea. I mean, the Harrisons not being Jewish was certainly not part of the Jewish community. I don't think they knew because at some point I met somebody, there's a Kinder Transport Association, I met someone who had been with a family in Norwich and I was telling Alan, he said, I wonder if they're still around. I said, look in the phone book. And they were, I mean, we went to visit them and it turned out there were 200 kinder transport in that part of England, but I never knew any of them. In fact, I never knew anybody else who'd been on the kinder transport. And uh, there was a association in England and then one was started here and they had a meeting. And it was so exciting to meet other people who'd had All these, similar- There'd been kids. Yeah, I mean, when I was in junior high in particular, there were other kids, there weren't many Jewish kids in the junior high, but I had a couple I was friendly with, and their family had been immigrants here and that, but I didn't know other people who'd been in similar situations, and I didn't read anything about it in books and that. I mean, I was an adult, and I found a book, and I can't think who wrote it, Percy, Marge Piercy a book about someone who had gone to another state and lived with an aunt and uncle and her experiences were so similar. Mm. And now, of course, there's a lot of literature about the kinder transport. Right. And including films, right? Yeah. Film. There is a very good film called Into the Arms of Strangers that followed 10 people who were on the kinder transport. And there's one person on this who was angry at her parents for putting it on and she wanted to stay with them. Of course, she'd be dead, but you know, it, I, it's hard. People had such different feelings about it. You've been back to Adelsheim. Tell us what that was like for you to go there. Well, the first time was in the 1980s. I needed to find out I didn't come from a black hole. Bertel Mars was supposed to go with me, and Mars had a heart attack. So Fred and I went, and we got there, and there was nobody out. It was so creepy. They all went home for lunch. But then eventually we found the town hall. Nobody spoke English. I don't speak German. I took it in high school and college, and I don't speak it. But they arranged the next day for someone who could translate to come around with us. And then they said, well, you can go to another town and stay. And I said, no, I don't want to be sent away again. So we stayed in a guest house. I had such nightmares that night that the Nazis were coming to get me, but we survived. And they took us around. I saw the house where we'd lived. I saw the brook where Edith had dropped the bread she was supposed to be taken to be baked. And we saw the Jewish cemetery. But I felt like a tourist. It didn't mean anything to me. But the next time I went, by that time, Bertel and Morris had been back and Reinhardt was there. He wrote to Bertel that he was planning a commemoration of the deportation of the Jews to France. And Bertel and I looked at each other and said, they need Jews. And Renee, my niece, she came with us too. By that time, my mother came from Rexingen. And a couple of years before that, Bertel had said, go on the internet and see what you can find out about Rexingen. And this young man answered and said, I'm from Rexingen, but I'm going to American U in Washington. So Bertel went to meet him with Morris. And then he came to Seder at our house. He spoke to my kids where I taught and that. And he had said, my parents would be happy for you to stay with them. So Bertel and I went to Rexingen and we saw the cemetery where a lot of our family had been buried. So that was, kind, you know, to see that, because I know more about Adelsheim than Rexingen. And then we went to Adelsheim. While we were there, we met someone First of all, Bertel was talking to the, she, when she'd been in first grade, while she could still go to school, somebody in their class had died. So she met someone else who'd been in the class and they were talking about what happened to this person. And then somebody came up and said, my father used to give your parents food after dark. And I said, Bertel, you think it's true? She said, yes, there'd been other letters and our mother had said that. But he said his wife was very concerned. She was afraid of what would happen to her family, their family, if they got caught. And somebody else told us the same thing. But then the ceremony was on a Sunday in, in the synagogue that was in the next little place over. There were about 100 people, a big age range. It was all in German. 
which I didn't understand, but I could feel the emotion. There were neo-Nazis outside and there was security outside. And I came home and I had everything translated. One of the things that Reinhardt had found was a list of everything that had been in my parents' house, pages and pages, including rags. No furniture, so somebody had helped themselves to the furniture, I guess. And my sister said there used to be a doll that they couldn't play with that wasn't there either. But it was an amazing list. And the other thing that Reinhardt had found was a letter from the mayor of Ottelsheim. When my father was sent to France, his leg didn't go with him. And it was a letter to the people who made the leg saying, send the leg because he can't work without his leg. So it was very interesting to go. Um, this inventory of goods that were in the family home, it was so detailed. It was down to, if I remember right, like food in the refrigerator? It was really down. It was pretty This, this is what's in this home. Here. Yeah. Yeah. And that, what was in the home was then auctioned off and the money sent to Germany. Yeah. It wasn't that we got the money. Right. They got the money. Right. Um, you've mentioned Reinhardt several times. Mm -hmm. and he's been instrumental in getting information. Who is Reinhardt? Reinhardt, well, Mr. Wedderham, the man who I originally met when I went the first time, had known my parents. And he was the person that people who were Jewish and wanted to know about their family would write to. But then Mr. Wedderham got a little too old for that. And he gave it to Reinhardt. Reinhardt was a teacher in the local high school. And he had an after school club. And they did a lot of research. I'm sure they did some of the research into the family tree. So, so like, what research, like what happened to the Jews that lived in our town? Yeah. Yep. I mean, at some point I had written and asked him what he could find out about my father. So I have a whole um, list of all the things about my father that Reinhardt and, and I guess these kids. And this found. is just something he does. Yeah. Well, not so much anymore. He has grandkids now, but he used but to. But it, it was more like his passion. Yeah, yeah, and he's retired now, but he did find out. And apparently, in a lot of the small. German communities, there are people like this who mm -hmm. do the research mm -hmm. and that. So, yeah, I found out a lot from Reinhardt. Now, Reinhardt came to visit here once with his wife, and he's in contact with a couple of other families from Adelsheim, so visited them too. And then at some point, his son and his, um, Tim and his wife came here because Tim was at the University of Maryland as a postdoc, and I was very good friends with. Um, his wife, Christine, we'd go to the museums and do things. And being part of the memoir group, I wrote an article. I knew more about their life here than he did, and he knew more about my life in Germany. It was kind of an yeah. ironic kind of thing. So he did come to visit while they were here, too. Um, I think we, we have time to turn to our audience for okay. some questions, but I want to ask you one more that I'd like to ask before I turn to our audience, and that is, your, your sister Bertel passed away yeah. recently in December, and, mm -hmm. and your, your other two sisters had died earlier. And my brother. And your brother, Herman. With the, with the passing of Bertel so recently, what, what has that been like for you, leaving you? I can't talk about it. OK, all right, all right. We're going to turn to our audience, and um, we'd like to invite you to ask some questions if you would like. We have microphones, one in each aisle. We do ask that you go to the microphone and use it for the question. Make your question as brief as you can. Um, I will repeat the question just to be sure that we hear it correctly before Esther responds to the question. Um, and then just I want to mention at the end of the program, uh, we're going to hear again from Esther uh, before we close the program. And she leaves to go sign copies of Echoes of Memory. But we have time for some questions. If not, I will. Um, continue to ask questions for a few more minutes, if we can do that. But um, while I'm waiting to see if anybody wants to ask one, I'll ask you another one, Esther, if you don't mind. When you were here with First Person in 2017, an audience member asked you a question that was along these lines. If you could go back in time and speak to the Nazi leadership, what would you say to them? And I know at the time you thought that was a really interesting question. Do you have any thoughts about that? I, I think what I said then, and I still think, 
why do people or leaders find it so necessary to find someone to hate? What does it do for them? But the interesting thing that I was going to say, my niece Tamar, who often comes, wrote a whole thing about that, and then there was an exhibit here about neighbors, mm -hmm. and she connected it. Because I don't understand what does someone gain by hating someone just because of what group they are. I understand you don't like something a person does, but to hate them because they are Jewish or that some other minority, why? What does it do for you? Right. Why does it make you feel superior? Mm -hmm. What's wrong with you? Yeah, I remember, I remember that question was one that you really- Yeah, it was a heart. tricky question. So we have a gentleman with a question here uh, to the left. Well, what language did you speak at two, and then did you learn English when you came to England? Is that what happened? Okay. What, what languages do you speak, and did you learn your English? You know, obviously you learned that when you got to England. That's all I speak is English. Yeah. I have tried German, and I, I guess I had, I had, my uncle who was in charge of me when I started middle, junior high, he liked the Spanish teacher, so I had to take Spanish. <laughs> And I certainly don't know German, but I think if I actually lived in German and had to use it, Germany, I would be okay with it. Did your sisters, did they speak German? Did Bertel speak German? Bertel could. In fact, when we went back, she only translated for one day for me, then she was back in German. Yeah. Okay. Herman knew German, didn't he? I think. We I don't know. We have a question here. We have a question here, and then we have one over here. Um, I'd like to know, um, you moved around a lot, but you were with the Harrisons the longest, um, and you said your grandchildren consider them like, or your children consider them like grandparents. Do you consider them like your, your like adoptive parents, or did you not create that parental child role? Question is, um, um, you, you, you were many different places, but spent a long time with the Harrisons. You mentioned that your, your children sort of thought of them as like grandparents. Did you think of the Harrisons as your family, as your parents? Did, didn't, did, never f felt quite like that? No, I, I close off sections of my life and keep things separate, which is why I have trouble mixing people I know from one part of my life with people from another part. It's kind of separate and, and that, though I think Many things that are important to me certainly came from the Harrisons. Yeah, thank you. And we have one here. Can I turn the mic off? No, the mic, just turn it down towards you, but it's on, it should be on. Um, what advice would you give future generations so that something like the Holocaust, Holocaust I mean, doesn't happen again? So, say, ask me that one more, ask um, us that. What advice would you okay. give future generations so that something like the Holocaust doesn't happen again? What advice would you give to help make sure that we don't have something like the Holocaust again? Is, Is that, that my like, last word? There, actually, we're going to hold because I think that's exactly what Esther wants to close on, so that's the perfect question. Um, thank you for that. I'm going to ask one more, and then we'll, we'll begin to wrap up. I will up. answer it. Yeah, we will answer. That's not going to get lost at all. You, you shared with me that, um, that you obviously didn't know your parents, obviously, but yet you, feel their inf you felt their influence on you as a mother uh, and, and as an adult. And will you say a little bit about that? Well, clearly, number one, they really believed in God. And they also thought family and friends would take care of us they thought, thought family was really important, and family is really important to me, and it was to Bertel. Mm -hmm. um, I think it, it is to all of us. I mean, my daughter's here, but so are two of my nieces. And almost all of my family that lives in Philly and here have been, and some of their children have been, um, I, th I think it's the family connection that I feel. Do I know 
how they celebrate at holidays, haven't a clue. Do I know what diseases were in the family? Don't know any of that kind of stuff, but it's this family, the importance of family, the importance of looking out for other people, um, which I think comes from my parents and some from the Harrisons. I mean, they took me in, they didn't have to. Um, but my sisters, they didn't need to take care of me. And I feel, while I am definitely a survivor, I've been very blessed by people who really went out of their way. They loved me, they took care of me, they did things for me which I feel I need to repay in some way. Don't know if I do, but I try. Okay. Right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn back to Esther in just a moment to close our program. I want to thank all of you for being with us. Remind you that we'll have programs here until August 8th. Our programs will be live streamed through June 6, and all of our programs will be made available um, on the YouTube channel of the museum. So if you can't come back, um, you can see other programs um, as you wish. We hope you'll come back, and if not, maybe think about us for our 21st year next year. It's our tradition at first person that our first person has the last word. So I'm going to turn to Esther to close our program, uh, and then she will leave immediately from the stage because she's going to go up and be available to sign copies of Echoes of Memory, which has examples of her writing in it. Esther? So it answers your question too. I think it is important in this day and age to keep informed about what's going on, to read newspapers. Don't get all your knowledge from social media. Talk to people who have a different viewpoint. Learn what's going on. If you're old enough to vote, vote, pay attention. My other thing that I usually say that I really feel strongly about, most of us are not gonna be in a position to influence what happens to big groups of people. You can help one person, you can help two or three people. Be aware of what's happening to people around you. If you see someone who needs some help, help them. If you're a kid and you have kids in your school who don't have anybody to eat lunch with, invite them to eat lunch with you. You can do simple things to help people, but do keep abreast of what's happening in the world. It's really important. Thank you, Esther.